Today on Inside Utah Politics, a Salt Lake City surprise. The week starting off with Mayor Jackie Biscupsi dropping her bid for re-election. So what does that mean for the race moving forward? We're breaking it down with Salt Lake Tribune columnist Robert Gerke. Plus, a look at this year's leg legislative session through the eyes of the next generation. We're checking in with millennial lawmakers to get their take on how it all went down. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Good Sunday morning and thanks so much for joining us for Inside Utah Politics. I'm Glenn Mills. We're just months away from the election for Salt Lake City Mayor and the race has turned on a dime. Monday, incumbent Mayor Jackie Biskupski surprised everyone when she withdrew from the race, citing family reasons. Recent polls show the mayor had some ground to gain if she was going to win a second term, but still, her exit no doubt changes the game. It's been more than four decades, by the way, since Salt Lake City has had a one-term mayor. Salt Lake Tribune political columnist Robert Gerke is here this morning with his take on that and some of the big issues from the legislative session. Robert, always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, happy to do it. So we had heard some rumblings that maybe Mayor Biskupski was eyeing something yeah. else, but it's still one thing to hear it and then to yeah. actually see her get out. So I think all of us were like, whoa, yeah, that just happened. I never really believed the rumors that she yeah. might not run again. She had announced just a, a little over a month earlier and on you know, her first week of February. And so for her to do the 180 and drop out of the race this abruptly was surprising, I think, to everybody. It certainly shifted the field of the race. Um, there were people who were asking, well, would she have stayed in if she was doing better in the polls? But, you know, from everything I've heard from people who are close to her, that this is a, there's a legitimate family health issue that she's got to attend to. Um, this wasn't an excuse to sort of exit gracefully. Um, and so you, you wish her well in that regard, you know, you don't, you don't want to wish that on anybody. But going, ahead, you know, going forward, it's completely changed the, the complexion of the mayoral race. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that, because we've already seen other candidates jump in since yeah. her announcement. People who were waiting to see what she was going to do, I think. Well, yeah. maybe not waiting to see what she was going to do, but not wanting to jump in while she was in the race that are now in. Right, Senator Luz Escamilla is, is the one who's, who's joined, uh, and, and she was sort of watching from the sidelines. During the legislative session, she said she was considering it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there, she wasn't going to get in, it, it appeared, unless, unless there was an opening there, you know? And so really, Jackie's stepping aside really cl cleared that playing field. Uh, the other big beneficiary, I think, is Senator Jim DeBacchus, former Senator Jim DeBacchus, who um, was the front runner according to all of the polling that we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got good name recognition, and then to lose your closest competitor in the race, I think, you know, he can kind of punch his ticket through the primary at this point. Who, who else punches their ticket through the primary of the remaining field? Because it may even get more crowded than it is now. Y yeah, and that's sort of the big wild card, right? Senator Escamilla, I think, is her entry into the race puts her in one of those top two spots. But it also makes some room for people like David Ibarra and David Garbett and Stan Penfold, uh, former council chairman, to sort of make some, you know, to create, to, to go for those people who were going to support Mayor Biskupski mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe they would be their second choice. They can make the case for that. Um, I also think it changes the, the, the debate itself because, you know, when, when we have an incumbent mayor in any race or an incumbent for any office for that matter, it always kind of becomes a referendum on the sure. performance of the person who holds the office. And so, now that there's an open seat, you know, there, it, it's more a discussion of ideas and vision for the future. And I think that can be healthy for Utah. We haven't had I was going to say, since. that probably benefits the residents of Salt Lake. Yeah, I think so. <coughs> I think so. It's not so much the mayor did this well or this poorly. It's more about this is where we see the city going. And, and, and I think it presents them with a clear choice. And I also think that, you know, we haven't seen that since Mayor Rocky Anderson decided he wasn't going to run again. It was Mayor Becker's first term. So it's always been at that referendum, uh, you know, choice of do we keep the mayor, do we lose the mayor. Now it's, a, now it's more about a discussion of ideas. A lot of people coming out and thanking the mayor for being a trailblazer yeah. in her political career as well. So that really, the, the tone there really turned as well. Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the <coughs> most poignant statements I saw was uh, one that uh, former Senator DeBacco uh, said, and he's, he, he called her the Jackie Robinson of the LGBT community mm -hmm. because she was the first elected LGBT member 
Uh, and, and she wasn't treated well by a lot of the legislators up there. It was sort of a dirty secret. She didn't make a, lo a lot of it, but she wasn't necessarily welcomed with open arms. But she persevered, and, and as Senator Baca said, so others could follow in her footsteps. Yeah, much different story today, and someone had to be the first one to take that step yeah. and, and lead to that. Let's move on to the state budget. Very interesting conversation around that, yeah. even just how it all played out. You know, the, both chambers seemed so far apart at one point, coming together. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the pet projects, though. We had the Hatch Center, $1.5 for yeah. that. That ended up getting taken out. Do you believe it's because of the pressure that was being put on by the public? That's what I was told, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean not, not so much, uh, not just the public, but even internally in the Republican, among the Republican caucus, there was a lot of resistance to that. Uh, and leadership was willing to stick to, you know, take the flack for it for, for a while. But ultimately, I think had there been a motion on the floor to, with, to pull that money out of that project, I think it probably would have had a majority support. And so the leadership decided to take it out. Um, it, was, it was one of those things that I think was galling to a lot of people that, that you know, why are our taxpayers being asked to foot the bill for this uh, uh, project that is, in many people's eyes, an ego-driven project, right? It, it's not common for a senator to have this sort of spacious library kind of mm -hmm. uh, and, and so and so you know I think that that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way what are some other areas someone might look through the budget and say uh, I don't know about that you know it, there's always there's always projects that are, are pet projects or pork projects for lack of a better term and you know every every year the things like the the WebMD golf championship that uh, is is I believe about hundred and fifty thousand dollars one of them that uh, it com it comes up again and again and again has been the wolf delisting the state has been putting hundreds of thousands and now up to millions of dollars into trying to get the the gray wolf taken off the endangered species list uh, back in 2013 there was an audit of the money that had been spent up to that point and it was pretty scathing uh, that they hadn't you know, they didn't have uh, good accounting measures. They didn't have good, to, you know, a good way to measure whether it was effective or not. But the money's kept flowing, and they put another two million into it this year. And and it's interesting because that comes at the expense of other projects. You know, Joe Biden always said, "Don't tell me your priorities. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you your priorities." Um, we had a twenty-four million dollar request for affordable housing. We're we're in an affordable housing crisis in this state. Uh, they wanted 24 million for it and really came away empty-handed. And so it's projects like that that suffer when money is spent on, on uh, as, as one former lawmaker call it, projects of regional concern or PORC. Right. Uh, the sponsor of that, Senator uh, Jake Andrick, Andrick yeah. made no bones about his disappointment for not getting that funding. This session really took on kind of its own personality. They got yeah. a lot of the heavy lifting done early before our closing day, but also a lot of unfinished business. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those now. The conversion therapy bill, that really became a controversial spotlight of this session. It really did, and it was uh, kind of shocking to see the way it, it played out because uh, the advocates, the proponents of banning conversion therapy had worked for weeks to make sure that they could get the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the governor's office into a place where they were comfortable with the bill they were proposing. But I don't think they anticipated the backlash or the, the pushback from the people who are practicing conversion therapy. Frankly, coming into it, I thought this was sort of a relic, something that wasn't really done anymore. But they came out in, in droves for the, for the second hearing and, work, and the pressure that was applied to, to the governor, bo by, b both by those uh, therapists and by conservative representatives, got him to support this watered down, very watered down mm -hmm. version, a, a version that was so bad that the advocates and the sponsor, Representative Hall, said that they're better off passing nothing than passing the version that they proposed. And you saw the backlash of that. And you saw young people, I think, which was one of the you know, heartening things about it. Young people mobilize and, and demand an apology from the governor's office, and, and they got it. They got the meeting with Spencer Cox. They got a written apology from the governor. But there's going to be some work to, left to yeah. do on this, and, and so they're going to they're going to tackle that in the coming months. Interesting. When I asked the governor about that, why did you switch to the to the amendment? He said because that's what could have got through. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see ha uh, how that plays out there. I uh, want to hit one other bill real quick because we have about a minute left. Mm -hmm. That's the red flag bill. Yeah. So, uh, Representative Handy couldn't even get a committee hearing on that one. Yeah, that was disappointing to me, frankly, because this is a bill that came up initially after the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is if somebody's a risk or a threat to themselves or others, they, you don't want them to have fire, access to firearms. And so people, loved ones, family members, uh, it, or law enforcement could go to a judge and, and the judge could issue an order to, that they surrender their firearms until they can prove the competence. 
Uh, it's, it's a bill that has been passed in a number of states, going back even, I think, 14 years in Connecticut they've had it. It's a bill that's been shown to work, to save lives, and it was one of the top recommendations of the School Safety Commission. Uh, Handy worked, he labored over this all, mm -hmm. all summer long, trying to get... He a, took a beating over it Took a well. beating, and, and trying <laughs> to get to the place where the, the gun advocates were comfortable that there was enough due process where somebody who was asked to surrender their guns could appeal that. And it just, he, he couldn't get there and he couldn't get the support of the rules uh, committee to, to even let it have a hearing. And so that was disappointing. He's going to keep working on it and, and we'll see where it ends up. All right, our time has uh, come it to a fast, conclusion. Yeah. It sure does, but I uh, appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, where's a good spot for viewers to uh, follow your work? Oh, yeah, uh, follow it at sltrib.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at Robert Gerke. All right, a good follow. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate yeah, your time. Thank you. Still to come, prescription drug prices, no doubt, are skyrocketing, leaving some to make unthinkable choices. Could importing cheaper Canadian drugs be a solution? We'll dig into the debate. Plus, defense spending makes up a huge chunk of our national budget. We're taking a look at how it's impacting the deficit as well. That's next.